3DMJers, what is going on? I am here with Steve Taylor, a uh, dietitian and uh, classically beautiful male, I would say as well. That's probably a, a good description. Um, and we're going to talk about supplements. It's something that we obviously have touched on here and again. But uh, one of the things that I specifically wanted to make sure we talked about was the decision tree of when it's worth just taking a supplement. Um, and I think that's a worthwhile conversation because I will actually make the argument that the calculus differs from when you might decide to implement some type of strategy that you'd find in general nutrition or even general exercise science research. Um, but before I jump into that, Steve, you, you come from the, the church of registered dietitians, um, where they preach real food, eating your colors, um, getting your, your pound of fruit and veg and, um, things like the RDA of protein and never going over it. I'm kidding. Um, what is your perspective and what is your typical training taught you about supplements and, and, and how has it evolved from when you were in school to seeing now in, in 2024? Uh, i say typically the, the training has always been that the supplement should support the diet. Um, they should be a supplement to the diet um, and that you should try to aim for whole foods whenever possible. Um, so it's kind of like, and I basically take a, I don't know, like a similar approach with clients of like, if I'm going to have somebody add in a supplement, there's a specific reason for it. Like I'm not just mm. like randomly having people start supplements. Um, same thing with like uh, dosages. So like whether it's like something like a multivitamin or iron, like if somebody needs, like if somebody wants to take a multivitamin, um, just as kind of like a, I don't know, a plan B just to make sure they're getting enough. Um, I always go with like a low dose, just like a one day multivitamin that's from a, a reputable company that's been third party tested. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing with like it really anything it, it's just it should have a purpose and then not just more is better but what's the dose that we actually need to get the result we want yeah and i think that differs a lot from the way the typical supplement consumer maybe not even the typical supplement consumer the typical bodybuilding or sports supplement consumer views it um in my experience just having you know hung out with athletes uh coached people myself um just kind of hanging out in the quote unquote bodybuilding culture, if you will, um, being a instructor or teacher and interacting with a bunch of exercise and nutrition interested undergrads is that the mindset is typically, um, I'm on the hunt and I'm also willing to hear a good pitch. You know, like if, if you can tell me on your YouTube channel or on your Instagram post or more traditionally in, uh, like a supplement ad, uh, that I will see that maybe there's there's a reason I should buy this supplement. I already have this this hope that there's something that's going to unlock some some gains that I couldn't get otherwise or accelerate my progress. So I'm just waiting to confirm my biases. And if you throw even kind of a half-assed done study at me, something that you know, like it was done in a petri dish or with a mouse model, or if you're loosely alluding to something, but you give me some percentage changes and some figures. Um, that there's a chance in hell that it'll benefit me and I've got the spare money. Sure. Um, and I remember this mindset, like in Oh five, I had like a pill case that was like fully kitted out for like what I'm taking. And at different times of the day in 2005, like I was, I don't know, 87 and had just recently survived a heart attack. Um, and looking back, I would say the vast majority of those supplements did nothing. Some of them were potentially counterproductive and I probably had some type of banned substance in my system given the era and the time it was in that I didn't know about. Um, and I'm probably less natty than I even think I am. So, I mean, that's, that's just thinking back then. Um, it would have been interesting just to get like a random drug screening. This was before I started competing, of course, but um, I think that is the typical mindset. I don't know how often do you run into that. I know a lot of le less of your athletes are competitors in the bodybuilding space but what is your perspective uh my perspective on which piece like is is that the mentality well i would say when when people start with me they typically think a supplement the supplement portion of what we do is going to be a huge piece because uh -huh. it's like you know well we know we're going to talk about supplements right and i'm like yeah but you know it's not that exciting there's not that many that we're going to take um so yeah typically it's they think it's going to be a huge piece of our process when really it's a very very small piece 
How often are people coming to you already taking supplements um, or are they actually coming to you and expecting you to give them? A, it sounds like they're coming to you expecting a list. If there is a list, it's much smaller. And most of the time, like you said, is for a reason. But are they often ever coming to you and you're culling this this long list of supplements? Mm -hmm. Seems like yeah. I feel like most people are at least taking some supplements. And like you said, there are some people out there who are taking 15 supplements uh -huh. uh, or more. Um, I've definitely seen it on like intake forms for 3DMJ athletes of like just with the page of lists of all kinds of supplements um, where, yeah, then we'll trim off. It's actually good that you've seen our intake forms because you, as a dietitian, you go over them all uh, just for any kind of red flags and, and just to make sure we're not all of a sudden lost the plot. But um, the the number of, of clients, and obviously I'm speaking to a slightly different era because I stopped doing like at taking on new athletes regularly in like 2014, 2015. But the number of times where, especially with the Skype call or like the one-on-one -on -one video calls that we do kind of one-off, where the person gets on the call, you know, and, and they might've paid us a couple hundred bucks or whatever it was in the time or the era or even our current era with our prices being a little bit higher. Um, and they come away saving money. Like when I tell them to, to bring it down to, for like you said, 15 supplements to three, um, I look and I'm like, yeah, like maybe you should be paying me more. Like I, I just saved you a lot of money here, hey, you know. Like, <laughs> but um, no, I, I find that's incredibly common. And so, Steve, the counter argument to that, um, which I I, I want to present a case against, is well, what's the harm, right? So, if ninety percent of, and that's a generous figure, ninety five percent, probably more accurate of what is actually sold. Um, is only conditionally helpful um, or is not helpful, but there's no harm, why can't I as an adult try it out? You know, just like I would try a new program, um, except with a program, like I might be trying something that, that's worse and I could be making poorer gains, but with something that is either neutral to positive, then, then what's the downside? And that is one of the main messages that I think is really important and that is not understood in the uh, the current kind of industry is that there is a, especially with the folks who listen to this podcast, a lot of them being future or current drug tested athletes, um, there's actually a tremendous risk. And I think people don't understand how risky it is. So we were talking about this off camera, but I just want everyone to think about what would Eric Helms or Steve Taylor's or any of the coaches at 3DMJ's lives be like if it came out on social media that one of us had failed a drug test and how that would affect the community, how that would affect our athletes, our trust, uh, our content, our personal lives, because this is our income, you know, um, and our relationships, because this is also impacting our values. You know, the fact that it, it, it appears that we're trying to cheat and drug test the sport. Um, and when I see the typical athlete response of, um, oh no, I, I was taking a tainted supplement. If you look at the comments section, it's like 95%. Yeah. Bullshit. Liar. Of course. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Sure. There was an Andalone in your creatine, like whatever, bro. Um, and I think it's really interesting to assess, well, how often is that the case? How often is it true? And, and what is going on there? So there's two papers that we're going to include in the show notes here. Uh, one, uh, came out in March of 2022, so reasonably recent, in Frontiers in Sport and Active Living uh, by Lauritsen, and it's titled Dietary Supplements as a Major Cause of Anti-Doping Rule Violations. And the other one is a, uh, it's a review that came out by Walpurgis and colleagues in August of 2020 in Foods. Both are open access and free on PubMed, and I encourage people to read these, especially if you're a coach or a drug tested athlete. Uh, titled Dietary Supplement and Food Contamination there, and, their impl and Their Implications for Doping Controls. So from the, uh, what, what, this is going to sound like I'm just trying to scare everybody, but from that last review I just mentioned, I want to briefly talk about a, uh, a 2004 comprehensive study that was published uh, where they took a look at 634 non-hormonal dietary supplements they were purchased from 215 different companies across 15 different countries. Now, 57 of the manufacturers were also selling pro-hormones. So again, this is 
Now, the point in 2004 in the U.S., this was when the Anabolic Steroid uh, and Pro Hormone Control Act came out. And this is when they first started making an effort to try to get pro, hor pro hormones off the market. Uh, it would be a few years before that actually truly occurred. And um, there's an analog of that currently happening now that's different with SARMs. And 10 years ago, it was basically analogs of meth that were being relabeled and put into stimulants. So this is a, a, a cyclical thing that's continuing to happen. So even though this was at the height of the era where people were trying to sell off all of their pro-hormones, so it's probably biasing the sample a little bit, I think the results are quite stunning. All right, so 57 of these manufacturers were also selling pro-hormones, and 45.6% of the tested products were obtained from these suppliers, okay? So that means that if you were a company producing a non-hormonal dietary product, almost half of the manufacturers you would use were making supplements for other companies that included hormones, okay? So that means that even if you as a company owner in the supplement industry are not even selling any hormonal products, there's a risk of contamination. So the powders, tablets, fluids, and capsules were homogenized. Uh, that means they just broke them up, extracted, and they analyzed them uh, with mass spectro spectro spectroscopy, okay? That's what the, that's the, the researchers did in this study. And out of the 634 products, 14.8%, 94 of them, contained anabolic androgenic steroids that were not declared on the label at reasonable concentrations. Um, and 21.1% of the supplements bought from companies also selling for hormones tested positive, while it was uh, just under 10% of the products from the remaining suppliers. So obviously, there was a higher risk you know, if you're buying from a company that, you know, let's say you're buying creatine from a company that happened to be also selling Andrus, Andro back in 2004, um, higher risk. If you're buying it from, you know, a supplier that didn't, lower risk. But 10% but is still crazy, considering that we've got these intake forms, people taking 15 different supplements. That means that if in the mid-2000s, if you were taking 15 supplements, I would bet that you were consuming some type of anabolic steroid in some dosage. So that tells you something. Now, they did repeat that study a few years later, and the numbers had dropped drastically, and that's because the Anabolic Steroid Control Act had came out, and at least the companies in the U.S. and a few other countries were probably no longer doing that. But we had the same kind of thing occur again a few years later, and all the the controversy surrounding uh, banned substances being in, in, in and pre-workouts, and now we're seeing it again with SARMs, like I said. So this is a cyclical thing. But I think that's something that people really need to consider. And then the other review, the main thing that I want to point out, uh, and this specifically looked at 18 years of doping control. So they looked at actual, like, WADA test outcomes. And they noticed that in 26% of all the analytical anti-doping rule violation cases in the period of 2003 to 2020, the athlete claimed that a dietary supplement was the source of the prohibited substance causing an adverse analytical finding. So that doesn't mean that every single one of those cases that, that was accurate, that might've just been their defense, but there's a big difference between saying that on social media and then actually going to the doping tribunal and claiming that and trying to prove it. So the fact that that's actually happening officially means that that was a viable defense that the athlete put forward. And they may have thought it's a viable defense and maybe they could get away with, but you, it's, it's, it's a hard burden, burden of proof when you're in this position. Um, and interesting thing was, even though they're very loath to accept that as a defense, having talked to doping control officials, in half of those cases of where the, where the athlete did claim that it was an anti-doping rule violation due to supplement contamination, they found evidence to, to actually support the athlete's claim. Now, I can tell you that many times the athlete did not save any of, any of the supplement, uh, cannot afford the costs of getting it tested, or doesn't even remember what they took, and they're like, well, you know, here's what it is. So I would guess that it's at least 50% of the athletes who are actually claiming uh, that there was an adverse supplement uh, effect that are, that where they're finding evidence is accurate. And the rest of them, they, they can't prove it, but it's actually the case. So what that tells us is that when we look at the actual testing failures of sizable proportion, at least a quarter, are due to supplement contamination. And when we look at supplements being produced somewhere, 
between the realm of maybe five to twenty percent of supplements, <laughs> um, especially if they're if they're being uh, bought uh, during eras where there is a banned substance issue, and and, and the supplement supply line have banned substances in them. Um, and there's also other data in these reviews that are really important related to just harmful things that aren't supposed to be in there, like heavy metal contamination. Um, or just not having what the label claims is in there. Um, people were probably aware of the recent controversy around trigesterone. Um, you know, like Greg Doucette and other people claiming they did these massive things and kind of basing it on anecdotal claims. And then when they actually got tested, basically none of the products actually had trigesterone even in them. Um, so that is a, a constant and consistent critique that I have of the supplement industry is that while we are looking at it and we're presenting uh, the argument to ourselves as, hey, you know, let's say, you know, th th there's not a meta-analysis yet that says this works, but let me go ahead and pull the trigger. It's not neutral to positive. It's actually a high risk of a negative neutral outcome, potential positive outcome. But yeah, I mean, to me, that I think is something that is not spoken enough about and is sometimes dismissed. Like people are like, yeah, yeah, sure, there's an androlone in your, in your, in your multivitamin. And it, I think people think that it's only going to be happening in muscle building supplements or, um, or like stimulants or things like that. But that's, that's, that's not the case because it is the manufacturer sometimes where the issue lies. And I think if, if, if I, if I wasn't in the scene, you know, my, my first thought would be, well, what's going on? Like, especially like in the U S like, won't the FDA catch that? Um, cause I think a lot of people don't understand of like how supplements are are or are not regulated in the US. Um, and the reality is, is they're not really regulated. So basically, if if a if I wanted to make a supplement, like a protein powder, I could literally put flour in a jar, turn off the label of my computer, and sell it. And it, no one's gonna check that until they do. And so basically it's it's not until something gets reported enough times that the SDA, FDA would then go investigate that to then pull it if there was a reason to pull it. But it's not until after it's been out and after there's a reasonable reason to pull it that it actually gets pulled. So who knows how many people have taken the supplement at that time. Um, so, yeah, it's just it, it's I, and it happened with a conversation with somebody last week. We were talking about supplements and they're like, I was talking about how I like third party tested supplements. Um, and they were like, well, you know, like uh it's a supplement. So it's like, you know, the FDA, you know, you know, they got it. You know, I'm like, well, they don't actually regulate that stuff. I was like, it just, it just goes out there. Um, and then it, like I said, it's, it's the burden of proof falls on. There has to be something wrong with it to get it recalled. That's an excellent point. And it's not only the FDA that operates in that way. Um, there are other government agencies and it's really pays for you to know, um, how your local region deals with this stuff. And also considering that the supplement industry is a global industry, it's not like if you live in a country where they actually do test and verify every product for it to get on the market, that you can't just go online on Amazon and buy a supplement from the United States uh, or from Canada or from any other country. That's incredibly common, right? Um, it's really only when there's specific laws preventing an ingredient from getting into the country where you are going to struggle to get a supplement. So, so for example, uh, melatonin is prescription uh, in, in New Zealand. So if I try to buy a melatonin supplement online, uh, I can, but it will probably get seized at the border, right? And, and you're going to get things like that. Like, or your, your bean, for example, is a controlled substance. So if you buy a multi-ingredient uh, product with your bean in it, it gets shipped here, you're rolling the dice. Did like how awake was the you know customs control officer when he when he looked at the shipping labels, right? So, um, this is something I think sometimes I've even experienced because I, I I live overseas and I, I do a lot of international communications. Um, sometimes people think, yeah, sucks to be someone in the U.S. dealing with that, and I'm like, you know, it's not necessarily just a U.S. problem. Um, do you know how your uh, FDA equivalent? Uh, operates. And many times the answer is no. And then I'm like, oh, do you also make sure that you're getting a product from a local supplier? And sometimes the answer is yes. Um, but that's another reason why I fully uh, support uh, that, that that recommendation of getting third party tested. Um, and some of the ones out there like NSF 
or informed choice or informed for sport. Just make sure you do your research. Um, and another rough thing, and I can tell you this because I've consulted with a number of like evidence-based supplement companies that are trying to do things differently and better than the industry standard, is that it is extremely expensive to do third-party testing. So a lot of the companies who I actually trust or would recommend or who I appreciate or I know the people behind them, sometimes they can't do it. Um, so what I would also recommend is before you decide to buy a supplement, uh, especially if it's not third-party tested, is simply contact them and ask them to send a lab report that confirms what's in that and, and if they'll test the batch for you. Um, this is something Ben Escrow actually recommended on Iron Culture when we had him on. And he was like, you know, anyone who's actually involved in their own processes and, and has stock that they're going to send to you can and should be able to do that. And sometimes companies, in lieu of getting that third-party verification they can't afford it, they'll just send you lab reports of your batch, uh, your, your, your batch number. So, and if you don't get any response or if you get pushback on that or, hey, I can't do that, that's probably not a good sign, right? So I think that's a, um, a really good recommendation, Steve. Is there any nuances around third-party testing or things that people might not understand that is worth go going into there? Uh, I think I would start just because this is something, that, again, that I wouldn't know unless I was in the scene of like defining what third-party testing is. Um, so basically you have the supplement manufacturers are the ones that make the supplement, and then you have the supplement companies are the actual companies that sell the supplement. So it's like you can have a manufacturer make supplements for multiple different companies. So third-party testing is basically where you have somebody step in that line between those two who's not involved at all and test the supplement to make sure that what they're claiming on the label is actually in the label and making sure that there's nothing in the product like contaminants that aren't on the label. Because um, just going back to like, you know, how different supplements are regulated or, or aren't regulated, like uh, manufacturing practices, like the FDA has guidelines for like, what good manufacturing practices are, but no one is following up on that. No one is like making sure these manufacturers are following those practices. It's just like, hey, you should do these things if you want, you know? And then as far as like labeling goes, it's kind of the same thing of like, you're, no one is checking those labels. So it's like, you can put whatever you want on a label. And until somebody tests the supplement, the label could be a lie. And that's hard to believe because it just seems like it's like there's this thing on the shelf at Walmart. Like, how is that not true? Like, there's no way they could lie. So I guess they could. <laughs> no one's checking that. Exactly. So, yeah, when you see GMP, um, those are the manufacturing uh, guidelines that are recommended and technically required by the FDA. They're just not verified. So when someone has the GMP label, it just means that they've had someone actually come and say, yeah, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know, what do you want, a cookie? And yeah, I will actually pay to get the GMP on there. And and that is that is good. So, you know, having that on there. Um, and then when you see something like NSF or Informed Choice or Informed for Sport or some of these actual verified third-party agencies, they will be paid to bring someone in to actually do testing to ensure that at least in the batch they test, there is no banned substances. Um, and sometimes you can find like certain companies will have a line of their products that are more expensive that are informed choice or informed for sport or NSF or not, or sometimes the company will do everything on their own um, and will do, will do the whole thing. And sometimes, unfortunately, you will actually see companies that kind of have some type of pseudo false in-house label that just said like, let's like safe for sport that, and then that's not the right wording I, there because there are a number of these third, uh, third party tested ones. But if you're considering and you're looking at the label and you, it, it appears as though they've done third party testing, you know, it's 2024. Get your phone out. Google that. Is that a legit third-party test? Don't just assume it is. That's kind of like how people just put natural on a uh, on a product, you know? Um, and they're not putting organic because organic actually has a requirement, you know? So there are many label claims which appear to be something that is official and that does require regulation um, that are not. Um, so, yeah. Get your smartphone out. This is one of those times it really pays to be one of those people. That's such a great point because a lot of you will see a lot of supplements that will just say third party tested, but who it, it'll be like they won't say who did it or like it'll be it's no Tom. Yeah, Tom did it. He's next door. <laughs> that's a great. He came point. over. He tried. The, he tried the weight. He's like, that's really good. Doesn't taste like Nandrolone. You got Tom approved. Yeah. 
Hey 3DMJers, this is Andrea Valdez popping in real quick to tell you all about our latest video course in the 3DMJ vault titled The Physique Photo Guide. It's a 40 minute deep dive into the importance, the art, and the skill of collecting visual data for bodybuilding athletes. So many lifters shoot themselves in the foot by overemphasizing the numbers on the scale or in the DEXA scan, rather than focusing on what truly gets judged, which is how the physique looks on stage. And even if you don't compete and are just someone who enjoys training and chasing aesthetic goals, you would also be served by taking the time to learn how to collect more valid data than simply relying on what you think makes you look good enough to post on Instagram. And nothing's wrong with sharing your highlight reel online, but what any true physique athlete needs is a private catalog of standardized, well-shot, and consistent visual checkpoints at a variety of body weights and time points throughout their career. And that's exactly why coach Alberto Nunez created this course. So you have the tools and the skill set to make educated assessments about whether your training and nutrition protocols are working in your favor or not. The Physique Photo Guide is now the 23rd course in the 3DMJ Vault, which is our online learning platform of organized video-based education for serious lifters. You can become a VIP member to get access to every single one of those courses for just $25 a month or $85 per year. This means that you get this course, you're also getting the lifting library, the bodybuilding program design course, the advanced deload guide, the calculating your macros course, and many, many more. Head on over to 3dmjvault.com and sign yourself up today. That's 3dmjvault.com to get all access. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. So definitely get Tom to check your supplements. I think that that's, that's the, the the main take home there. Um, but no, 100%, uh, I think that's really useful for people to understand what is actually going on when they hear this. Because sometimes they hear these terms and know it's good, especially athletes. They hear, okay, I need to get third-party tested and I got to worry about this. But they don't really know what that means or what the supply chain looks like. And I think that's really helpful information. Um Another perspective I want to give is instead of putting on my, you know, like scared parent hat, I'm going to put on like my sports scientist hat, you know, like we're here to try to optimize performance in athletes. So it would make sense that if I think there's any chance that you would benefit from this, then I, I would, I would suggest you take it. And that was kind of the lens that I wrote, like the first and second edition of muscle and strength pyramids, when I did my initial, um, you know, videos on them and also the lens that I took as an athlete myself. Until I started to become more and more aware of, for one, the risks, which I think I've covered pretty well already. And then two, getting a better understanding of statistics and effect sizes and the likelihood of a potential benefit and having a more nuanced view on what benefit means. So uh, a great example would be beta alanine. So Beta alanine, you can find a meta-analysis showing a small effect and that it can improve performance. But I think sometimes we have such a low bar because we want the, the, the hope and the dream to be alive. We, we want to buy into the supplement marketing that we don't think critically about what is the effect we're even looking at. Like on balance, the data on beta alanine indicates that it's probably not beneficial for lifting performance of almost any type except maybe CrossFit because typically is for performances that last in excess of 30 or even 60 seconds. And the evidence that keeps coming out where you look at beta alanine supplementation to improve lifting performance, even when it's relatively high volume, it's mixed at best. And here's the thing is even when it's at best, you know, on this mixed side of it, like when it leans towards positive, what is the actual effect that we're looking at? What is the benefit? Well, it shows that you might get an extra rep or two somewhere sometimes. It's not showing that you actually get better performance in the outcome we care about. Like, let's say you're a power lifter. We don't have tests on longitudinal adaptations to 1RM like we do in, say, creatine. And we don't have any studies on longitudinal hypertrophy in response to taking beta alanine. So you don't actually have any evidence that this supplement is actually improving the outcome you want unless it is actual just performance. So again, like in the case of CrossFit. And last time I checked, it wasn't a ton of swimmers and middle distance runners and soccer players who were listening to the 3DMJ podcast. Maybe, and if that's you, and you actually are interested in improving acute performance in, in that type of performance, then absolutely beta alanine is something to consider. And if that's the case, 
you know, third-party testing, all that good stuff. And one other, one other option I'll get to. Um, but I think that's step one is, is we have such a low bar and such a desire to see positive results that sometimes we're like, ah, that, 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 yeah, sure. Aerobic metabolism, I'll take it. And it's like, that has nothing to do with what you want. Like, don't buy a testosterone booster. Buy, like, c- because it shows in, in some study that wasn't well done that testosterone went up 10%. Show me where they measured hypertrophy. Show me where they measured 1RM strength. That should be the first criteria. Did it actually improve the outcome I actually care about? Not a proxy for or something three steps down the causative chain that could possibly influence the environment that might possibly lead to it happening. Because one, it's a big leap. And how many times have we seen acute data not line up with long-term data to just assume it's going to be beneficial? And then two, what actual effect are we expecting? So we love to sing the praises of creatine right? Creatine, the most, I, I would say if you're going to choose one supplement for muscle building, creatine is the easy answer. Easy. But the effect of creatine on muscle building is small. It's just barely above what we consider trivial. It's something that you probably wouldn't notice on an individual basis, except maybe in the first time you took it. And a portion of that is the placebo effect. But even beyond the placebo effect, it is doing something. But supplements as a class are only going to have at best a small benefit if we're talking about like legal supplements that aren't actual drugs, right? So the act, the, the best possible outcome you can get in this very risky proposition, which I've described, is small if you've landed upon something like a creatine. So when you're taking a chance on a neutral or positive supplement like something else that's come out that has the beginnings of favorable evidence, it's probably going to be less than creatine. That's one thing you can be, be sure of. So the kind of the checklist I go through given there is a risk of harm, is are there actual data that are consistent on the outcome I care about, not something that should or maybe might lead to it or some type of acute performance? And then is the effect consistent enough to at least be small, not even trivial or maybe something else? And then I have to consider the risk. And I don't think most people go through that. I didn't previously because I kind of had that neutral to positive perspective. So like currently I don't take like citrulline malate or beta alanine, because I just, the data isn't there on the long-term outcomes. Um, Because, I mean, if we look at the data on training to failure, for example, Steve, we have data showing that training to failure makes your reps drop off more. But we don't have data to show that that fatigue from dropping off is making that a worse outcome compared to sub-failure training. Failure, training to failure on it, like when you hold everything else constant, is either going to be roughly similar or slightly better than not training close to failure. And I'm not saying everyone's trying to failure. It's obviously in the context of how much volume you're doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in a vacuum, you know, that in- inhibition of the total amount of reps you can do to a small degree might be worth being a little closer to like the limit of what your muscle can do in a vacuum. So the idea that getting an extra rep here or there is necessarily going to result in better performance, especially if effort is matched, I'm not sure that's that's true. And here's another one to throw a curveball at people. So the reason why creatine is the the one supplement I would recommend if you're going to take it for muscle building over caffeine, which has been studied more broadly because it's something that like 94% of people on the planet consume at some point in their lives um, and has applications beyond simply uh, lifting. And it's a, a sport supplement that's been around a lot longer and it's a general you know part of the food supply. Um, is that we actually don't have more than one or two longitudinal studies on caffeine and actual outcomes for like hypertrophy. There's some long-term strength data, but most of it, the vast majority of caffeine data is acute. So we don't actually know for sure that the boost in performance you get in caffeine right now, that you can feel uh, that you're taking pre-workout, is actually going to improve the outcomes you care about long-term. I'm not saying you shouldn't take it, you know, the day before your meet, or sorry, the day of your meet, and you might not benefit from that little boost of getting like, you know, four, three, five milligrams per kilogram on the day of, a, uh, of your competition. But I'm not sure that chronic use of caffeine is, is, is actually going to improve the outcomes we care about as, as lifters. Um, and as more data comes out along how long it's in your system and how it can it impact sleep architecture, my general recommendation is probably don't take caffeine more than 100 or 200 milligrams at most if it's not an AM after the time. 
because it's going to still be in your system. And the obvious is individual variability there. But as more data comes out, if you were to have 200 milligrams of caffeine at 2 p.m., it's probably having some small negative effect on, on your sleep, um, even if you don't necessarily feel it. And again, I'm not trying to be a scaremonger, but that's just what the data show. Yeah, you might be someone who is, you know, 110 kilograms and you tend to genetically just be a faster metabolizer of creatine. That may not be a true statement for you. But for the average listener of this podcast, who's sitting between, you know, 60 to 80 kil kilograms and, and probably has a more or less quote unquote average uh, response to caffeine, I'm comfortable saying that's probably a true statement. So a lot of the things that we are just like, oh yeah, why not? No harm. It's like, well, it's <laughs> potential harm. And what is the upside? So my recommendation for people is that you should absolutely be a late adopter and hold a higher standard for when you decide to use a supplement than you would for other things that come out from the evidence-based community. And that's actually a bit of a paradigm shift, and you're going to see that reflected in the third edition of the Muscle and Strength Pyramids. I'll be a little less fast and loose, a little more of a conservative, you know, grandpa helms as now that I'm 40. But um, I think it is actually just an evolution of better understanding the data. Do you think we're at a good point that to get in, well, what supplements do we recommend? Like, what do you recommend as far as supplements? I think there's one more thing I wanted to say, and that's about... Um, Steve, you're probably familiar with this, like licensed products, like your uh, your Carnison or your Creapure. Are you familiar with uh, with how that operates? Not really, no. Yeah, so you'll you'll often see like when you buy most of the big brands for creatine, um, they have like Creapure. It's it's a really common one. Uh, or if they're creating beta alanine, it's Carnison. You know, and these are um, basically B two B businesses. You know, so we have B2B and B2C. That's the business to customer or the business to business. Uh, the supplement licensors, they are manufacturers who've created a licensed version. That means they have a license. So the way we make this supplement, only we can do it and we can sell you a license to use it. And then great, you know. So obviously that's more expensive, but the benefit is, is that you know that it's being produced in a specific manufactured way where they could actually get a license, right? has IP protection behind it. So Carnison is a specific manufacturer of beta alanine and their whole reputation and their business model is staked upon producing high quality beta alanine that is consistently tested at the same potency and purity that then they supply to bigger companies who go, right, I don't want to deal with figuring out a source for my own beta alanine and I'm willing to pay because I have economies of scale because I'm, you know, I'm... Optimum Nutrition, for example, or something like that. I'm willing to pay Creapure for their micronized creatine. I'm willing to pay Carnison for their high-quality beta alanine. And those are basically third-party tested. Um, they're not actually giving you a label verification. They might be giving that to the company, uh, or they might stake their, their reputation on that. But to actually get that license, they had to go through a process that kind of indirectly ensures the quality of the supplement. Um, because their whole existence in the marketplace is based upon the, the uh, their ability to pr provide this very pure high potency product. So one thing you can be sure of, even if it's not third party tested, is that if you buy a creatine that uses Creapure, or if you buy beta alanine that is Carnison, and I'm not familiar enough with the other licensed products out there, that that's probably going to be a safe bet. Um, most of the time, however, you're going to find beta alanine and creatine, not most of the time. Much of the time, you're going to find these in multi-ingredient supplements. So you can't necessarily be sure that that's good to go. But if you're buying a single ingredient product of beta alanine or creatine, um, you can definitely do that. So don't just think, oh, it's got creapure in it. The whole supplement is, ne is necessarily therefore safe. Because if it then's got like tribulus terrestris in it or some nonsense, that that could be coming from a place that could potentially be contaminated. So that's one other um, avenue of ensuring safety. Uh, but yeah, I would say the first thing is the entry point should be, um, is this potential benefit large and, and a sure thing, not neutral or positive. I say neutral or positive a lot, but I really don't think that it should apply to supplements. I, it should be positive and the lowest possible risk uh, that, that you can make it when it comes to the supplement industry. Um, and that narrows the list a lot. Like these days, uh, I basically, the only quote unquote performance supplement I take, Steve, is creatine. I mean, I'll have coffee, 
before I train sometimes, but I don't actually get a uh, pre-workout supplement. Coffee is your only source of caffeine these days? Yeah, eh. pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Besides, besides other like teas or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I probably take two. I take creatine, monohydrate, and I take a, <laughs> a, a caffeine that's, uh, it's basically just a flavored caffeine. So I do take a, a yeah. it's a pre-workout, but it's, it's not like a pre-workout with a bunch of different like ingredients in there. It's, it's a flavored caffeine with, yeah. Yep. For sure. I do take some vitamin mineral supplements, but they are, they meet all the stuff that we already talked about, the criteria. Um, and they are specifically based upon, um, you know, blood work that I've done to see, you know, where I trend towards lower values. Um, and you know, as a, as a pescatarian, that kind of makes sense. And someone who diets semi-regularly. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's, um, that perspective is something that probably is new to some people who follow my content. And it's something that I'm going to be a little more specific and unified about as I talk about this moving forward. So, so yeah, Steve, you want to go into, um, supplements that we actually think are, are worthwhile? I think it makes sense for a, a podcast on supplements. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Thank you for tuning into the 3DFJ podcast. <laughs> yeah, just leaving it there. <laughs> Don't take anything except the stuff that works. What works? See you next time on the 3D of J podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, what's on your list, man? Um, I would say five, and one of them I don't even consider a supplement, and I'm sure you already know what that is. Um, but yeah, I'd creatine, monohydrate, uh, high quality one a day multivitamin if you want to, not essential, but like if you want to. Uh, EPA, DHA, that's it. caffeine. That's another one. Like if you want to, I just I love that. Half of it is like the placebo ritual of the whole process of me getting ready for a training session. Yeah. Like I can't deny that that is a part of it. Like if I was to like sure. set myself up with like, um, take, like uh, do a trial on myself and didn't know if it had caffeine or not, I'm sure I would still get a benefit of just drinking like a, a colored water before my workout okay. because it's like okay. part of that ritual. I know it's a huge part of it, but I do, I do feel it. So, uh, EPA, DHA, multivitamin, creatine, caffeine, and the last one, again, I don't even consider it a supplement, protein powder. Um, yeah. So it's more of like a food, but I, if we're going to talk about supplements, I think protein powder is a, it's a supplement, but it's a food. So whatever you want to say. Absolutely. No, I, and I basically have the same list um, and I would include in the protein powder things like um, protein-based foods that are marketed as foods, but are actually supplements. Like if you were to look at the the Quest chips bag or like their, uh, you know, the, 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 the fake Reese's from Quest, from Quest or things like those. I, I consume a fair bit of like protein foods that are actually technically supplements, I think. I'm not even sure. I think Quest actually does produce foods. They have like frozen dinners in the States. What, and which pizza. I love they saying. have frozen pizzas. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it, it is sometimes actually ambiguous. What is a supplement and what's a food? Um, but that is basically the same list I have, and I would categorize in the kind of the multivitamin conversation, um, any vitamin and mineral supplementation that you take based upon individual needs that come up and are recommended by a dietitian or doctor. Um, so yeah, I, I actually don't blanket recommend um, D3 anymore. Um, the data on D3, it's something that is often associated with health or performance, but I think it's probably better viewed as a marker of health rather than something that you can interventionally change and reliably improve health outcomes. Um, it's probably tells you something about your current status and it will reliably decrease in disease states or malnutrition or things like that. Um, and it's like, if you were to listen to, I think actually the perspective on like barbell medicine, um, on this topic and others, I think Austin Baraki does a quite a good job with this is like, he sees like he can make your blood work look good, but he almost views that as like masking a potential issue. Like why is your vitamin or mineral status going down here? You know, like, Oh, my iron's not looking good. Let me take an iron supplement. You might have internal bleeding, you know, like, <laughs> and, we, and we can make your iron status look good, but it doesn't mean the bleeding stopped in, in one of your organs. So I think, um, it's, it's, it's an important perspective to have, uh, that if there's a lot more going on under the hood necessarily, or potentially rather, uh, w when you're viewing some of these things. But yeah, I, I think, 
especially for the audience we have, where you're going to go potentially through cyclical periods of being on a lower energy and restricting the amount and the number of foods you can have. It's not a bad idea uh, to get blood work and then have it looked at by a medical professional or a dietitian before then you pull the trigger on vitamin or mineral supplementation. Um, also, another thing I would say is on the EPA, DHA, I think it also depends on what your diet looks like and how often you consume fish. Uh, I do think it is also harder to consume fish with the regularity um, that you might want when you wouldn't need a fish oil supplement or a algae supplement without potentially risking, you know, heavy metal contamination. <laughs> um, like I had, uh, I was consuming like a can of chunk light tuna every day for lunch for a while. And I finally thought, you know, I should probably get my mercury levels tested. Um, and Steve, I was one point above the reference range on where you should be the cutoff. And I was like, yeah, damn, even chunk light tuna, which is relatively low in mercury. If you eat a whole can every day, and also like me occasionally have like smoked, not even occasionally, frequently have smoked salmon at breakfast, which is even lower in, in, in mercury, by the way. So I don't think that's probably a contributing factor. You can get yourself up into a range of mercury that at least isn't advisable. It wasn't like acutely dangerous by any means. Like I wasn't walking around like having seizures or unable to do basic math, but the, like it was, it was a higher level than it should have been. And that, that changed my behavior. I went to a vegetarian uh, protein source for my lunches. So I think it, there is a, uh, there, there's a, the, not no pun intended, but there's, there's, there's a lot in this can of worms to, to open up, which I don't recommend a can of worms. I'm not sure on the macros on that, but, uh, yeah, I have a can of pea protein now at, at lunch. Yeah, I couldn't tell you the nutrition information for a can of worms either. Um, but I could say I do hear about mercury poisoning a decent amount more than you would not actually getting it. But you do hear if, like if somebody has been doing for a prolonged period of time, high amounts of like those uh, seafood high in, in, in mercury content, it right. does. You do hear about that. It kind of sounds like all oh, that stuff never happens to people, but like eh, it does. It unfortunately is a thing. And you can also have like subclinical but high levels for a long time that might be having some minor negative impact on you that you know you might attribute to something else you know why do i have brain fog all the time and again i feel like this podcast is one of the more scaremongery ones we've had um but i just but you know you you, you know me i wouldn't be doing that unless it was worthwhile i tend to be pretty laid back and i think that people are just far too cavalier with supplements based upon the potential benefit but the actual legitimate risks that are out there um, that we just don't want to be true because the supplement industry is so intrinsically tied to the bodybuilding industry um, and they kind of prop each other up and every fitness influencer or seemingly every fitness influencer, professional bodybuilder or athlete has some supplement that sponsors them or they recommend. And I would just, and there's something inherently wrong with that. But it's just a high probability of there being an issue with that just because of I know how this industry works and all the problems we've talked about. It may be that the one that they're sponsored by is an evidence-based company that does third-party testing and use licensed products. That, that could be the case. Fantastic. I'd love to see more of that, not less. But it might also be that that's not the case. In fact, it's probably not the case in, mo in most instances. So, so yeah. Now, does this mean that there's never a case of trying new supplements? No. I think there's nothing wrong if you're willing to assume the risk as an adult, um, especially if you're not a drug-tested athlete, um, of trying new supplements. I just think you need to be very aware of how often the supplement landscape changes. And the supplement landscape has changed, but not in the way that you might think. Like 15 years ago, there was a consensus that HMB was almost up there with creatine. And big shout out to the marketing geniuses at EAS, by the way, because they did a really good job. They actually had a book called like The Supplement Review, which was published by EAS, but they paid a bunch of scientists to write the review. And there was just enough evidence uh, kind of showing benefits of HMB to where people were claiming like, hey, this is, this is the next creatine, you know? So when I first started lifting Steve, it was like the big ones were, and you know, there's a parallel that I'll talk about in a second, um, which actually didn't have a lot of evidence behind it, but somehow just became consumed by everyone and they thought it was evidence-based. But it, back then it was, you know, like protein powder, creatine, caffeine, HMB, 
and maybe a few other supplements that uh, didn't really hold steady. And I think probably in in your era, Steve, it would have been branched chain amino acids. Would you say that's that was kind of seen like when you were coming up as like this is an evidence based supplement? Absolutely. I remember there was one summer. It was back in college. I had read about like you know you should have your big chunks of protein throughout the day, but then you could like spike protein synthesis if you just had like BCAAs in between all of your big meals. So for like an entire summer, I carried around like dates and BCA powder to spike my MPS between my big meals. So I, that huge, yeah, it was, I mean, it was, and it was around long before then, but yeah, that was definitely BCAAs were a big thing. Yeah. That was basically attributed purely to Lane Norton promoting his, his, uh, his PhD and then Cyvation making like BCAs and then every other company jumping on the list. Now to Lane Norton's credit, he's kind of walked that back. But if we look at the criteria I set out earlier in this podcast, does it measure the actual thing you care about, not the proxy? This would have prevented that, right? Muscle protein synthesis is not hypertrophy, right? Um, and then like, what's the potential positive effect? And when we actually look at the data on BCAA, it can look beneficial because there are multiple systematic reviews and multiple meta-analyses where they compare branch chain amino acid or amino acid supplements in isolated form to what? Nothing. Placebos. <laughs> and yeah, if you give people amino acids, just like we see in protein research, because that's what proteins are made up of, sometimes they'll have beneficial effects. Now, what are they measuring in nine out of 10 of these meta-analyses? Typically, it's not performance. Typically, it's not body composition. Most of the time, it's recovery indices from muscle damage. There's like two or three meta-analyses and systematic reviews showing that BCAAs are better than like a carbohydrate or no-calorie placebo for improving uh, the recovery from muscle damage. But when you restrict yourself to only looking at comparisons of BCAA in incidences where they're already consuming a high-protein diet, or they're comparing BCAA to EAAs or whole intact proteins, which are rare, you, this effect goes away. So this is another one of those cases. So yeah, you can try new supplements over time because the supplement landscape does evolve. Historically though, the evolution has been us slowly culling the herd and going, HMB didn't pan out. Uh, BCA didn't pan out. And uh, now I would even say that like our hopefulness for some of the supplements that do have an effect, they're now more conditional, like beta alanine, for example. That's something I would have recommended. You know, my stock standard pre-workout recommendation 2014, you know, creatine, caffeine, beta alanine. And then I was like, oh, maybe, maybe citrulline malate in there. And that's still potentially on the list of having a potentially small effect on repetition performance. There is a meta-analysis, shout out to Eric Trexler out there that's showing that it might have some small positive impact on performance. But we don't yet have kind of that gold standard rubric of does it measurably improve longitudinal outcomes and strength or hypertrophy if your goal is one of those two. And that's what I'd love to see. We're not there yet. Um, and the only reason I would say that's what I want to see is because there's a risk to taking any supplement. Again, not to kind of beat that dead horse even further, but it might be a supplement that could have a positive impact and the reason it even is like a meta-analysis showing it has an acute benefit, but you can't just purely view it from this neutral to positive lens when it could be a manufacturer that that also tends to produce, you know, pro-hormones and then just, you know, contaminated baskets out there. doesn't matter if it might be benefiting you from a hypertrophy perspective. It has a small dose of something that you get drug tested for when you compete in a competition. And now all of a sudden your entire athletic career is tanked. So I just think people need to have a, a very high standard of what they take. And then the risk of being a late adopter is very low. Like, okay, so it took you a year before you jumped on this new supplement train and, and that supplement's half as effective as creatine. You're never going to notice the difference in your physique in terms of the actual outcome. You know, like that would not be something where an alternative universe, you're like, oh my God, look at me on stage that three months of not taking supplement X, oh, no muscle at all. Jeez, I'm so lucky that in my universe, I, I jumped on the fast track train to supplement X because it's just not going to be the thing. Um, despite the fact that we want to believe that, despite the fact that the marketing indicates that. So anyway, that's kind of my perspective. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I don't have much, it's, it's related to that, but it just, 
makes me think of like when I got into lifting. I mean, I I worked it. I I thought supplements were like such a big part of it. I worked for GNC for five years, so okay. I was in the supplement industry heavily for a long time. Uh, and so yeah, I just I, it just I don't know when you're new to this stuff for some reason, just because of marketing, you feel like supplements are such a big piece. And so it's just kind of thinking about what you were just talking about there of like even if something else were to be half as effective as creatine, it's still a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the overall results. But I think it's just that that temptation of like, oh, it's a supplement. It's easy. It's and there's like something magical about it. I think that's what makes it like, oh, there's 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 got to be something there. It's like I can just take this thing. It'll just do the work for me or I can take this thing. And it's like, I don't know, it just has like a magical feel to it. Supplements in, in a way. It does. And to give a little bit of respect to the consumer, like it takes time and effort to develop habit changes, new ways of eating, um, a consistent training schedule. And even when you have done, you, you started on that journey, those things, like you feel like you're doing a lot and, and maybe you feel like you got a little bit extra to give and you really want to like go all in. I and mean, this is a timely podcast. We're recording it on, you know, mid January. Like there's a lot of people right now doing the new year's resolution thing. And I applaud that, you know, whatever gets you in the gym and keeps you there. Fantastic. And this could be that. And if someone went out and bought a bunch of supplements, in addition to getting a gym membership and, you know, starting to eat differently, I get it. And I don't want to discourage the motivation behind that because yeah, like you might've just kind of like filled your cup in terms of what you can emotionally intellectually and time manage for training and nutrition, but you're like, you know, but it's not hard. I was already taking, you know, like my, a multivitamin before I even got into fitness. I'm just going to get these other pills that are going to help me. And that's, it's a statement of commitment. It's a feeling that you're buying into. And like you said, Steve, especially if you came up in kind of the bodybuilding industry, uh, or, or that marketing material, it is initially presented as, as one of the big rocks not even something supplemental. Like when I first came up, I thought it was training, nutrition, and supplements. And then I quickly <laughs> learned like two things. Um, one, sometimes supplements, especially in the when we weren't talking about it as much, I think we've got a little more transparency with social media's evolution. Supplements was often code for drugs when you were actually listening to IFBB pros. Um, now it's a little more candid. Now it's a little more clear of a distinction. Um, but yeah, I, I'm willing to accept that if we're talking about being competitive on an IFBB open bodybuilding stage, that yes, drugs, training, and nutrition are the big three rocks. <laughs> but um, it's absolutely not the, the the like, oh, well, supplements are the natty light version of that. Absolutely not. Like the 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 effect you can expect from it is is way less, you know? So now it's probably something like, you know, nutrition, training, and sleep. Like if we had to make, you know, like, like a big three, which I think is still an oversimplification, but I get it, man. Like I was a, uh, a, a bodybuilding.com forum supplement rep for a while. Like I said, I had the, the post operative, like cardiovascular, uh, infarction, like pill cases, like level thing at the age of 21. I looked like I was, I was trying to survive at a nursing home. I was taking so much. So I was right there with you, man. Um, and I think it's it's a very understandable place to be when the entire industry and culture is intermixed with the supplement industry. Um, and I think it was actually worse in the magazine era because like these days, the promotion of bodybuilding is done by individuals on their own platforms for the most part. Um, like Chris Bumstead is not at the like the whims of Flex Magazine or like muscular development. But Ronnie Coleman, you know, Jake Cutler, um, even, you know, Victor Martinez, like every person who was like big in the era like 10 years ago in the kind of the proto or pre-social media days, their thing was, oh, I'm on the cover of this magazine. I'm in these documentaries, but they're being advertised, paid for, and subsidized by the supplement industry. And you would find five page like article ads in between every legitimate quote unquote article in Flex magazine or, or, you know, in any of these magazines where it's like a five page seemingly study evaluation on why it's really important to include carbs in with your, your, uh, your creatine. 
oh, by the way, it's actually a muscle tech ad. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't like an actual study. It was like an in-house study that we did. Don't ask for the for the raw data. We don't have that. But look at these guys wearing lab coats and look at the guy they're testing. He is really jacked. What is he taking? Well, he is taking, you know, the muscle tech in addition to, you know, other things. Don't worry about that. They're supplements too. So I think that era is 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 behind us, fortunately. But it's not like the supplement industry hasn't adapted to the social media age. Um, it isn't sponsoring, you know, anybody with 10K followers or more with a decent physique who's willing to uh, to, to take some money uh, or even just get some free supplements. So, yeah, it's, it's a slightly different game, but it is the same messaging. And I think the average person coming into the space does still think those are the big three rocks, um, you know, nutrition, training, and supplementation. When that... Supplements are are like 80th on the list in terms of other things you should start be worrying about. But they're easy to worry about. So I get it. I get it. I, I'm not one of those people that's like, don't even think about supplements until you've got everything else in order. It is at the top and the least important part of the pyramids, but that's mostly so you understand what you can expect to get out of it, what your priorities are. So I don't actually think it takes away from your efforts to take a pill in the morning. That's something that sometimes the dietitian crew, like I'm like... Like, don't even worry about that until you get your nutrition order. Get your big rocks in place. I'm like, does does taking a pill in the morning really prevent them from eating broccoli later in the day? Is that like, I, I don't think it does, but it might make you fail a drug test. It, it, it could give you an adverse kidney outcome <laughs> because sometimes they are contaminated or or risky. So yeah, anyway, that's, that's, that's my story, Steve. I think I've said the same thing multiple times on this podcast, but I clearly am passionate about it. And I can feel that passion. Uh, I'm glad you I, can. <laughs> I, uh, it's important. And I, I don't know, I, I have maybe three final thoughts just that aren't really tied to, to anything. But um, one, I guess, is tied to kind of how you started that last um, topic was talking about habits. And that is if you were to like add in the supplements. Um, this is just because I know I've struggled in the past of like being hit or miss with supplements. It's just like any other habit, like trying to give that thing a home in your day. So if, like if you are just wanting to start taking one of these few supplements that we mentioned, like a multivitamin or, or a EPA and DHA, um, just to increase your consistency of it, just like you said, taking a pill every day and taking it like with your breakfast. And there's something, you know, you could take a multivitamin at any time during the day. It's just if you do it at the same time, you're more likely to remember to take that and you're more likely to get it in more often. So that's just a simple like supplement taking tip. Uh, second thing is just, I don't know, like if I was to think about um, – if I, if I was listening to this and if I, it's something I've heard a lot and we could just hit it real quick because it, it, it falls in line with everything else, but a common phrase you hear is, is protein spiking. And so yeah. if I'd never, if I, you know, I might wonder what that was just if I'd never heard about it. So just, just real quick what it is. Um, it just kind of falls in line with everything else we said about supplements of uh, basically protein spiking is like when a company, let's say on their label, they can't, they claim that a supplement has 25 grams of protein. Um, what they could actually do is, is that could be 10 grams of whole intact protein. And then the other 15 grams are just like one or two, like cheap amino acids or some other more harmful, um, ingredient that contains nitrogen. So basically it's, it's, it's just, again, it's, it's, if you're going with third party tested supplements that are legit third party tested, that's something you're not gonna have to worry about. Um, and then probably the final thing is is just looking at like from like a micronutrient perspective, um, like you said, if somebody was to add something in, like typically like I'll have people do blood work for it. And then like, you know, iron is low or vitamin D, that's when we add that in. Um, if somebody is consuming a vegetarian or a vegan diet, we have done another podcast episode where we talk about the micronutrients that you just want to be mindful of to make sure you're getting enough if you consume that type of diet. We'll link that podcast episode in the show notes of of this episode. Perfect. Those are great, great final thoughts. And I got nothing to add to them. I can just echo them. Like I have uh, whey and creatine post-workout, not because of the magic post-workout window, but because when I get home from training, that is a time where I can kind of like have it attach to to what I do right then and there. So, you know, absolutely. Um, great points. Yep. The <laughs> amino acid spiking is... One of the many issues that we see in uh, in the supplement industry that will be solved with the suggestions we made. And absolutely, if you do have reason to believe that you could have a micronutrient deficiency, do get the blood work done. Don't just assume 
you know, that, that, that it is an issue. I think some people are like, oh, well, I spend a lot of time indoors. So I'm going to supplement vitamin D3 or, oh, I'm, I'm on a mostly vegetarian diet. So I'm going to take, you know, B12 and, and iron or something like that. I would act, actually do the legwork to get the, uh, the, the, the test done because there is such a thing as, as taking too much and it's, it's potentially just as, if not more harmful, depending upon the new, the micronutrient of taking too much of something and getting a, uh, a too high of an amount. So yeah, I think that's, that's well said, Steve, I appreciate your contribution. It's always good to know that I have the church of dietitians on my side to, to verify that I, I'm not too out on a limb as being this, you know, crazy, crazy kooky sports scientist, you know, always making recommendations in journals to take supplements instead of whole foods. But no, in all seriousness, I think, um, if anything, I'm probably moving toward the more conservative side, but, uh, yes. Thank you for joining us, not only Steve, but also the listener, who hopefully is now scared straight, and like Nancy Reagan told you in the 80s, won't do drugs or supplements because they are killing our children and destroying our society. And next time, please join us on the supplement-free podcast, 3D Muscle Journey. And in all seriousness, I hope you have a great 2024. What's going on, everybody? Eric Helms here, Chief Science Officer of 3DMJ. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And let me just take one second to tell you about MASS, Monthly Applications in Strength Sport. This is a monthly research review that I do with Lauren Colenzo Semple, Eric Trexler, as well as Mike Zerdos. These are experts in their field, and we cover all the information relevant to you as an athlete or coach if you're working with strength or physique athletes, or if you're a recreational or competitive athlete yourself. We cover nutrition, training, sports psychology, and health. And we do this in written format, as well as, since you like the podcast, audio summaries, as well as video concept reviews. If you're a trainer, we also have continuing education credits for ACSM, NSCA, NASM, and ACE. So head over to 3dmusclejourney.com, click on the products tab, and you can find us there. I look forward to seeing you and enjoy the podcast.